Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. This week, I had the opportunity to stay down at the shore in North Carolina for a week, just to have a bit of time off. And my house is right on the Albemarle Sound, which is a really interesting body of water. It's a large freshwater estuary. But I've always been struck by the tremendous organic movement of the water and particularly the action of the waves that unlike other bodies of water the waves are driven and the tides are driven just by the wind this force can sweep down in one moment it's glassy smooth and within 20 minutes we have three foot white caps and now that i've been on the water and doing a bit of boating and things like that these sudden shifts of waves and behavior in the water can have an enormous impact on the ego, the person who's, you know, mucking around in it. And so I was talking about this uh, with Lisa and we were reflecting on this phenomena of waves and the symbol of the wave that of course shows up in science in a number of ways, shows up in art in all kinds of ways shows up in dreams very significantly. And so we thought today that we would talk about the wave as a symbol. And as an aside, uh, today Deb is not going to be with us. She was feeling a little bit under the weather. Yeah, I, I think that this is a really fascinating image. There are so many versions of waves. There can be sort of gentle beautiful waves that lap at the seashore and lull us to sleep. There can be uh, tremendous uh, frightening waves that slam on us as we're swimming or threaten to capsize our vessel. And there are even tidal waves that are very potent images. I would say that that may be one of the most common dream images. I think we've all had a tsunami dream at one time or another. So it's really rich territory to be in. So one of the things that I found myself thinking of as you were talking, Lise, is that waves are evidence of energy. That for one reason or another, whether it's wind or the moon or tectonic plates shifting in the base of the ocean, energy is released. And as energy moves through this body of liquid, if we're talking about water, it manifests different phenomena, which is exactly as Jung described the psyche and the unconscious, that as libido moves around inside of us, it shapes, changes, and conditions the libido, which impacts the ego. I mean, the waves are not just moving un- obstructed through the psyche, but they crash into the ego and they have an effect on us. So starting with this idea of the tidal wave, I I myself have actually never had a tidal wave dream for whatever reason, but I've had many clients who have. And usually in the dream, it is mostly from the spectator's point of view. Somebody is in some kind of a shore environment and they look out to the ocean and this incredible wall of water is building up. And often what the dream ego is doing is figuring out what it's going to do Mm -hmm. in the face of this unimaginable energy that has built up in the unconscious and now is moving inland, moving into the populated kind of left brain aspect of the psyche. So the analysis is not just why is your psyche producing all of this tumult, but what's the way in which the ego is going to orient to it? 
Yeah, and I mean, I, th- I think the real life situation where you're standing on a beach and you, you see the, the water draw out and that's the precursor. And then perhaps if you can't get to higher ground quickly enough or you ignore the warning that the tsunami sweeps in, it's the sense that there's very little that you can do. I mean, if you're in this real world situation, the only thing you can do is seek higher ground. By the way, you don't get you don't get a ton of warning about it. I mean, now there are tsunami warning systems in places that are uh, susceptible, um, but but nevertheless, it's it's usually it's not usually a, a a lot of warning. So there is a real sense of urgency about it and a sense of being overcome by uh, this natural force that is so much bigger than us. I mean, I think the, the only other similar thing would be a tornado, which often, by the way, shows up in dreams in, in very similar ways. But the, the sense is that, you know, unless you can get to higher ground, you will be swept away and much will be swept away. And I think that it can be an image. It, it, it often correlates with the, the tower in the tarot. It's like that which has been built up will will likely be be swept away by whatever's coming. So it, it feels very catastrophic to the ego. I'm thinking about the idea of the flood in the Bible and that when I've seen videos of these catastrophic tidal waves in Japan and then the catastrophic tidal wave that happened, was it in Indonesia? Indonesia. Both happened very, very quickly. And like the biblical story, there's a way in which this unstoppable force of mm-hmm. nature sweeps mm-hmm. inland, grabs everything, and, and in a sense, scours the earth, bringing it down to this kind of primal uh, level, just as it did after the flood, re- returning the earth to this pre-human state. Well, in that way, it feels really darkly numinous. And it's not surprising that uh, ancient cultures assigned tidal waves to the work of the gods, an angry god, Poseidon. Mm -hmm. And for us, when it shows up in our dreams, I often imagine that it is a symbol of the self with a capital S. It is this raw, primordial, divine energy that is going to kind of have its way with us. You know, Jung said, an encounter with the self is always a defeat for the ego. And I can't imagine a a better image of that than standing on a beach and looking at this tidal wave coming at you. I'm thinking about uh, a dream that someone had told me many, many years ago. And this person was very, very smart, had an enormous thinking function, had a big career in a particular aspect of engineering and so his dream ego was really trying to figure out how to stay safe and in that dream he ascended into the top floor of a very high skyscraper so that even though the wave was impossibly tall a couple hundred feet tall he was above it and looking down and observing the the carnage and then left with the question of how is he going to get to dry land so it speaks to me about one possible way that we respond to these overwhelming unconscious interventions that sometimes we can ascend to a level of abstraction a level of very refined thinking that we can try to use what the ego has built as a defense against the overwhelming power of the unconscious, which this dreamer was able to do in the dream in as much as his psychic state was not overly obliterated, but he was still left with the problem now of a city that had a hundred feet of water on top of it. And what would his life look like moving forward in the dream world from that point? Which means that he'd have to, thinking about it in a rather clever way, he'd have to become a kind of seafaring soul because the world is now different and is covered by water. 
it speaks, I think, to how uh, we often assign our psyche unconsciously assigns the divine to images of water and to waves in particular. You know, Joseph, I think that that was really important what you said a minute ago that, uh, that when there's a wave, there's been a release of energy. And it's an unconscious energy, right? It's not like anything that we have control over. So it is, it is an image of the autonomy of nature and of the psyche that this thing just kind of happens. And, and it moves me to think of surfing. Now, I don't surf, but I have known people who surfed. And they all speak about it in absolutely glowing terms as a deeply spiritual experience. And so if I think about surfing as a metaphor, I mean, they talk about, surfers talk about catching a wave. You know, it's, it's literally riding a wave. And so as I understand it, and I'm sure that the surfers will write into the podcast and, and tell me, let me know where I've got, whether I've got it right or wrong. But it's a question of timing. And then it's a question of sort of making yourself available to be carried by this force and and sort of balancing yourself there. So in a sense, it's a surrender to this energy, which is a wonderful image for the relationship between the ego and the self. Writing on that, no pun intended, (laughs) that uh, I am thinking because here in Virginia Beach, we're near the shore and I have uh, worked with just a few um, slightly older men who had had a lifetime of surfing. And the thing that I was impressed with is how extraordinarily awake they are when they're out on the ocean, mm-hmm. and how many different subtle factors that they are monitoring, both in terms of the life in the ocean, whether or not they're safe, there is a shark population, you know, off the shore in Virginia Beach, as well as trying to anticipate where the energy in the ocean is flowing so that they can position themselves to take the best advantage of it. Uh, And when I've heard people talk about what they're monitoring, it sounds almost supernatural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That kind of incredible awakeness, which I think is part of the euphoria that people feel not just that they've successfully found a relationship to this overwhelming amount of power, Mm -hmm. but the heightened state that's required in order to interface with it, as you had said, Mm -hmm. is also uh, of a different order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think about the clumsy way that I stub my toe and, you know, stagger around in, uh, in the world physically, as opposed to this extremely attuned kind of cultivation Mm -hmm. and and that probably speaks to all of us in terms of a way to approach the unconscious Mm -hmm. can we be as vigilant attuned to be able to monitor these multiple factors and sense how things are moving yes and i and i think with with surfing you have to be reverent toward the power of the ocean you take it seriously you know that you could be uh, turned upside down at any minute and thrown upon the sand, mm-hmm. but you are seeking to partner with it. You are seeking to to find its rhythm and then kind of surrender to that and, and keep your own conscious standpoint, right? That's the image of kind of balancing. But when we're in dialogue with the unconscious, this is this is exactly how we want to be. We want to be respectful of it, mindful that it's much bigger than us. We want to uh, position ourselves so that we can avail ourselves of its bounty and its energy. And we want to not be swept away by it. We want to maintain that balance point on the top of the wave where then it can just carry us in very gently and drop us on the shore. So it speaks to, as you said, the respect, which means we understand that we could be injured, but it takes a certain level of skill and we have to kind of know our level of skill. When I've seen uh, surfing competitions, let's say in Hawaii, I mean, some of these waves are frightening to even look at. I I can't imagine exposing oneself. uh, They're kind of life-threatening waves. 
and yet these extraordinary people are able to move in this Hermes-like skill, you know, skating on the top of this enormous amount of power. I'm finding myself wanting to find words to describe what it's like to be engulfed mm -hmm. and what that would mean symbolically and psychologically. And of course, there's different magnitudes of that. I remember being a kid raised on Long Island. We would body surf. We were eight, so it didn't take an awful lot for the wave to just gobble us up and turn us upside down and cast us mm -hmm. onto the sand. And how does one manage doing that, not inhaling a bunch of uh, water? Of course, yeah. you learn how to do that pretty, pretty quickly. So... There's those smaller tumblings which remind me of being captured by a complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just being grabbed and spun around and sputtering at the end of it. You're kind of tossed up back on the sand, wondering how it was that I just resigned from my job of 20 years and it was a terrible idea. <laughs> now I'm mm -hmm. kind of screwed. You know, the wave turned me upside down and it seemed like the perfect thing to do, mm -hmm. you know, 20 minutes earlier. Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a great uh, being being sort of tossed by a wave is a, is a good image of being in a complex that we we lose our stance we're we're literally turned upside down we we don't know which way is up maybe for a minute we're in danger of drowning we're sputtering and gasping for air and it can really feel like that when we're gripped by something powerful that we're just kind of helpless in the moment although in those kinds of waves that happen at the shore, there's a sense that at some point we're going to have our feet under us again, which is a bit more hopeful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I think of being engulfed by the deepest waters of the psyche, I imagine or I return to the experiences that I had working in the psych hospital, mm -hmm. where people were pulled down you know, pulled a mile down mm -hmm. into the unconscious in such a way that all of their senses were dominated by unconscious content, which is very humbling mm -hmm. that we can hallucinate sensations. We can hallucinate uh, visually. We can hallucinate sounds. And one of the most common signs of a psychotic experience is beginning to smell foul odors that no one else can smell. Mm. And so it's not just that people are seeing things, which might happen on an LSD trip, for instance, that any number of parts of the sensory mechanism can be owned by the imaginal world. And of course, people wind up in the psych hospital because they cannot find their way back to the surface. That yeah. The ego just doesn't even know where the upward place is. You know, just continuing with this idea of engulfment, we, we talked about it as a complex. You, you brought it up as an image of psychosis, which I think is uh, really relevant. There's also being kind of inundated by feeling, which perhaps is connected with being in a complex, but I don't think it's exactly the same thing, where, where you, could, you could just be sort of engulfed by a wave of sadness or by anger. And that, that can feel you, your whole body can just be kind of flooded with all of this affect that becomes very diff difficult to, to regulate. If I'm using all this kind of terrible psychobabble. We can be engulfed by a wave of feeling that's difficult to manage. And I love the way the wave is a metaphor for that because if you're in the water, it is such an unavoidable kinesthetic encounter. And strong feelings are unavoidable kinesthetic mm -hmm. encounters. It's not abstract. I mean, your mm -hmm. body is being sloshed around with whatever is happening. Talking about getting abstract for a moment, I want to see if I can dip into the realm of physics. And boy, this is really, I'm skating on real thin ice here. So I hope that the physicists will, will write in and uh, maybe correct me or... Uh, take this a little bit further. But as I understand it, waves are very important in um, particle physics. And every wave also has a trough. And I believe that the amplitude 
of the the wave portion is equal to the, the the bottom of the trough. So in that sense, it's a it's a deeply kind of archetypal phenomenon. The wave is it's literally sort of baked into the nature of matter and and light. It's in some sense a real image of the balance of the opposites. That there's a there's a crest and then there's a trough and a crest and a trough. I guess that the idea that matter exists in a wave state is a, a part of the theory of quantum mechanics where there's this notion of a wave particle duality. And apparently, I guess at the submicroscopic level, all matter exhibits wave like behavior. Again, this this goes really deep. I hope I didn't just totally embarrass myself, but <laughs> I, th- I think you get where I'm going. Well, what it, what it speaks to me is that this uh, periodicity, this kind of rising and falling of energy is essential, that it's at the foundation of what it is to exist. And that even though we might fantasize about a steady state, or even I find it rather beautiful on certain early mornings, the sound will be kind of glass smooth. But the truth is that it's going to begin Mm -hmm. to become tumultuous in a few seconds. And that we need the kind of churning process, both in the universe at large, but also in the human psyche. Waves in natural bodies of water pull nutrients from the deeper levels of water and kind of mix them up and down. Mm -hmm. It mixes temperature in the water so that bursts of heat energy can move around. And it also impacts things. It slams into the shore, changing it. It slams into these coral reefs, chewing them up, which actually is used to create beaches, or that is what beaches are composed of. And that we depend on this process of churning in the natural world as as well as the psychological world. And I think when we can make peace with that, and just as you were saying, understand the value and the telos of the churning process, this movement up and down of all things, then we can accommodate it. Much like my client who was trying to figure out a way to survive the tsunami, that that was his accommodation, which also was very congruent with his personality style. But that once we begin to track our own movement up and down, we can then accommodate it more elegantly, more skillfully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that the wave is just a kind of very normal, normal part of life. One of the ways that I think this is so relevant is that any of us that came from a particularly traumatogenic home, we have a tendency to believe that whatever adversity is in front of us is now the new standard. So we have a fight with our spouse and so the marriage is over. You know, or my kids stormed out of the house because they got angry and they're never coming back. Like this is now the new normal. And we forget that all of these things rise and fall and that peace is going to return, that the energy is going to be dispersed, that for the most part, we're going to be okay if we can adopt, as you were saying, this surfing idea, this highly observant trust in our in our ability to relate to these natural forces you know i'm i'm glad you brought that up because i almost feel like if if there's sort of one skill that is just absolutely essential as we begin to navigate sort of adulthood and the choppy waters of emotion it is that knowledge that negative feeling states don't last forever I mean, I think that this is really relevant in, for example, when we get a little depressed, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things about depression is a little bit like being drunk. It warps your perception. It alters your judgment about the nature of things. 
so that you think, and this is very, very common when you get depressed, you think, oh, this is the way it's always going to be. And you can't imagine if you're depressed that it's ever going to be different. (laughs) And so getting a little bit of dry land in there that can say, I know I can't imagine it being different, and yet I also know that it will be, is, makes a huge difference in our ability to manage negative emotions. I absolutely agree, and, and that we have to sometimes discipline ourselves to remember that, that the storm will abate, and peace will return, and life can get back on its feet. I think that's absolutely important. I was also thinking along those same lines of the idea of the night sea journey, which sometimes is called the Nikia, that even for the ancient peoples, when they would see the sun set in the west, particularly on the ocean, they would imagine that the sun had now descended into the ocean all the way to its bottom and was traveling along the bottom of the ocean. And it was uncertain what was going to happen, whether it was going to be destroyed by monsters. But somehow the sun fought its way back out of the ocean in the east and rose again. And so the cyclic nature of day and night and the fantasy that the sun has to overcome something and does overcome it every night and rises every morning is something we could also use to hearten ourselves when we are caught in our own Nikias, that there is something that is moving us to the East. When I think about the mythology around waves and storms, I I also think we mentioned Poseidon, uh, but there's also the, the Inuit goddess Sedna, And there are many, many different versions of the Sedna story. So let me see if I can sort of summarize one briefly. Sedna is being taken to marry someone she doesn't want to marry. And she somehow winds up, I think her father throws her overboard. And she's trying to climb back into the boat. And he chops at her hands and chops her fingers off. And from the tips of her fingers grow seals, I think. And then she, the, the remaining bits of her fingers, she grabs on again and he chops more of her fingers off. And those bits of fingers become, you know, walruses and other sea mammals. And then eventually she sinks to the bottom of the ocean and becomes this kind of underworld goddess down there who is both, um, as you can imagine, you know, kind of forlorn and lonely and angry, but also is life giving. She provides all all of the food for the Inuit people. And they believe that uh, when she is angry and she's withholding food, or when the waters get choppy, that the shamans need to go down and comb her hair Mm. to propitiate her. But there's the sense that, that she's beneath the waves causing these great storms that occasionally happen because she's unhappy. So that... So that in this sense, the wave is an expression of a very deep, mute, archetypal pain. It reminds me of a number of different myths where the divine feminine has fallen into darkness and is obscured, but her effect is still knowable. The story of Sophia and her sparks of divinity being somehow distributed through the earth, and the Gnostic task is to find that and to redeem it. In alchemy, the idea that gold is hidden somewhere in lead, this valuable, mysterious substance, and requires this effort and art and magic to bring it up out of its secret place. So all of these myths where the feminine disappears downward or inward has to do with something falling out of consciousness. It might even suggest around the myth of Sedna, which was this shift 
of feminine archetypes leaving the culture and the rise of a more masculine-dominated context. And Sedna waiting in the base of the ocean for her time to rise again and rise into consciousness. And we may very well be seeing that in these interesting times. Many people talk about the rise of the feminine and particularly feminine archetype and feminine values. So we can imagine Sophia finally pulling herself out of the earth, the gold fighting itself out of the lead, Sedna finding her way up, Yudhidice finding her way out of Hades by her own volition, by the way. Mm -hmm. Interesting times of change. But I think when something is put into the unconscious, it absolutely churns and requires some kind of a response from us, even if we can't pull it into full consciousness. It's interesting that the shamans, or at least what little we know, didn't try to rescue Sedna, but coming down and tending to her would appease her distress. Combing her hair, I think that's a really interesting metaphor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we should also talk about uh, the life-giving quality of waves. And that makes me think of the birth of Venus, the birth of Aphrodite. In, in Greek mythology, Kronos castrated Uranus, his father, and threw them into the sea. And this caused the sea to foam. And out of that white foam arose Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. And the foam was said to be his sperm that was fertilizing the ancient waters and giving birth, just as parts of Sedna's body gave birth to various phenomena. It certainly gives credence to this intuition that all of life has proceeded from the ocean and then onto land, which our scientists and anthropologists tell us is true. I'm also thinking the way waves are enlivening. When I think of myself, you're kind of on a jet ski out in the sound and contending with even small waves and kind of crashing around and navigating on the surface, that encountering these little bursts of energy that come towards us in each even small wave challenges us to keep our footing, challenges us to stay awake. There's something enlivening and fun and even euphoric, much like About riding, surfing. riding the waves of life. Riding the waves of life and mm. figuring out the skills that one needs to be able to continue to move forward in a little bit of chop <laughs> and and perhaps with that we can move over to a dream did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone we're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing balance insight and guidance as we make key decisions At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During dream school's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, Reveal unknown facets of your personality. Unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. So today's dream dreamer is a 28-year-old woman who is in graduate school for clinical social work, something both Joseph and I can relate to, and also working part-time. She writes, I am paddleboarding with my ex-boyfriend and several other people 
mostly older adults. We are in a mountain lake with an evergreen tree covered mountain rising from the lake behind us. The sun is out and the water is calm. It feels pleasant. After some time passes, I notice several people quickly swimming to shore. The sky has suddenly drastically darkened and I think it's either about to rain or the sun is setting so it's time to leave. The water gets rougher now too. My ex and I swim to shore and I am surprised by how quickly and easily I am able to swim. When I get to shore, I notice that the older adults are struggling in the water. I want to help them, but my ex stops me. It is now that I notice that the dark sky is actually due to the fact that the mountain is completely on fire and the fire is rushing down toward the water. I have to stand and watch, hoping all the older adults make it. The fire reaches the water and the last of the older adults are thrust to shore. It is very dark now and there is something beautiful about the fire. I want to get a closer look, but I'm wary of getting near the water, which I know will be scalding. I get closer and try to take a picture, but at that moment I go to capture the image. The smoke obscures my view. And for context, she says, my boyfriend of six years and I just broke up a week ago and I have been totally devastated from the split, trying to make sense of it. And the feelings in the dream were content and pleasure and then confusion and sadness. And she says, I frequently have dreams involving water, the ocean, lakes, and most often swimming pools. Swimming in lakes and pools has always been very soothing for me, though I am very scared of the ocean. Over the last few months, I've been exploring my femininity and connecting with my own power, my fire, that has been dormant for many years. Well, it's so interesting that the dream brings forward these polarities of water and fire. Mm -hmm. And what is the psyche going to make of that? Generally, when opposites are constellated, it announces the beginning of some kind of attention to hold the opposites, but the promise of an amalgam of those two things, which could bring her some sense of peace, particularly in the midst of this agony that she's going through around loss. You know, I, this is one of those dreams where I, I feel like sort of jumping in the deep end with, so I'm, I'm just going to go go with it. I, I mean, I think I have a strong feeling of this dream because I, when I was 28, I suffered something similar, which was actually quite life altering and, and frankly led me to become a union analyst. So, so, so I, I suppose maybe I'm, I'm freighting the stream with my own, my own experience, but be that as it may, first of all, I'm noticing that she's 28, which is in astrology, it's the Saturn return. And even if astrology is not your cup of tea, that late 20s transition into 30 tends to be a very critical time for many people. Um, so I'm, I'm just noticing kind of where she is in her life. And, and the agony of having a boyfriend of six years break up with you. I mean, that is, that is such a loss because it's not just the loss of the person, which can be traumatic enough. It's the loss of the imagined future together. So that's a, that's a very deep secondary loss that sometimes even goes unacknowledged because at that point in a relationship, of, of course, you've imagined spending your life with this person, maybe having children with this person, maybe you've spoken about it, and all of a sudden that's just wiped away. I'm really taking in that this is a dream that's happening in a kind of critical moment of, of change for this dreamer and, and pain too. I, I just want to acknowledge that. But I'm so curious that it's the boyfriend who keeps her going back into the water to help the older people. And I, I'd be really curious about who the older people were or what, I, you know, if there's anything more about that. I'd also be curious about what the dreamer imagined the boyfriend's motives were, the ex-boyfriend's motives were in holding her back. I'm going to assume that the motives were something like he, he didn't want me to risk my own health to help these other people. And then I think we're in this realm of this important thing that women have to learn to go through, that women have to learn how to put themselves first, that, you know, some women come up to adulthood and are very good at that already. I don't, I don't want to say that all women are bad at it, 
But in general, it, it is a challenge for women, especially someone who might go to social work school, who might be oriented to be a, a helping person, that, that it can be difficult to really find your own fire, put your needs forward, stand for your own needs. And so it's a bit of a paradox in a way that this ex-boyfriend who has just hurt her so much is playing the role in the dream of be selfish, save yourself. That's okay to do too. And, and it seems like that might be a very important lesson that she needs to encounter now. That sounds very poignant. It sounds like something that would be helpful to the dreamer as she's in a place of transition. If I were to use just a little more Jung jargon, I would say that the ex-boyfriend is carrying her own masculine spirit, the animus, and that when the ego and the animus are in right relationship, there's a feeling of capacity and energy and peacefulness and dynamism, and that you're able to swim to shore very easily when the female dream ego and the masculine animus are a team. There's a way in which adversity is much easier to overcome, and particularly that there's enough energy. As the animus has a very energizing effect. There's a feeling also that the animus, which is connected to the collective unconscious, is able to see things that the ego can't, at least initially. The anima and the animus are able to look very deeply into the unconscious in a way that's safe for them, that the ego would really be overwhelmed by and then reports back to her, there's something going on here, you need to hang back. And to her credit, she's also able to believe it and trust this intuitive information from the inner masculine. And then, of course, the ego becomes aware of what's happening. I feel a little confused at a certain point that the water, is, the fire is rushing to the edge of the water and the older adults are rushing out of the water, which kind of suggests they're rushing towards the fire. No, no, no. I think the fire is kind of, she says it's kind of behind us. Ah. So I think it's like on the opposite side of the water. That's how I imagined it. So the older adults are able to kind of escape. Seeing the older adults floundering in the water evokes the idea of the drowning king and the splendor solace. Mm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And might have suggested that something in the psyche that's she that she has aged out of mm -hmm. it's no longer useful is needing to return to the unconscious but that's not quite what happens in the dream that the older collective wisdom perhaps in her is still relevant still has enough life force to move itself out of danger still having a place in the psychic environment it's very dark now, and the fire is beautiful, and she wants to even move towards the fire. The fire is calling her. But then the reality of the smoke comes in. We've all known these moments where something exciting has happened that's dangerous, and people are beginning to feel so they're kind of captured by something. I've had an Alice Sands talk about you know, going into the top of the Empire State Building, and as they're looking downward, there is an almost uncontrollable impulse to jump. Yeah, we, we just talked about that and the imp of the perverse, Joseph. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why they uh, now have mm -hmm. the top of the Empire State Building caged in, f at least on that little uh, platform that people can walk around because people were really jumping off the building, bridges. I have those kind of chain link fences at the side because people can be swept away. So there's something that is, uh, like you said, the imp of the perverse. There's something self-destructive that's kind of beckoning towards her. So I'm also wondering if here in her grief and devastation that something self-destructive is beckoning to her. Because that that can happen. We can f drink too much, eat too much, go into something that's dangerous but alluring. I have a different feeling about that. I might be wrong, but let me let me uh, throw this out. 
So the dream starts off so beautiful and the lake is calm and everything's great and the sun's out and all this. And then suddenly there's this like, oh, okay, people are leaving and they're leaving quickly and the sky is darkening. It's time to leave. And I hear this as it's time to leave this kind of protected world of fantasy, maybe leave the world of childhood, which I think is what, what actually happens in that late late 20s transition. Like you sort of are really coming into your adulthood around age 30. It's time. It's time to... Um, end the fantasy, which may represent the end of the relationship. It may have been that there was something about the relationship that was keeping her in a very comfortable, very pleasant, but but maybe somewhat re- regressed or, or just a kind of stuck place in terms of psychological growth. And and then the, the boyfriend, car- paradoxically, by breaking up with her, has kind of punctured that fantasy, has encouraged her to uh, see to her own needs, although he, this may not have happened consciously, but this is kind of what the situation's calling forth. And then there's something really numinous about, Joseph, what you mentioned before, that the opposites of fire and water. This would be this kind of cataclysmic scene that would, would be so much bigger than us. There's something of the divine in it. And she's drawn to it, which I think I'm thinking, well, that's kind of good. Like, you know, maybe again, I'm putting my own stuff on it. But the outcome of my kind of Nakia that resulted from this situation when I was 28 was incredibly profound. What I did was basically walk toward this numinous experience, even though I didn't understand it and I didn't know what it was doing. And it was life changing. I mean, I think she's not ready yet to fully see it. It's too overwhelming, but in, in some sense, I see a positive telos that she's fascinated and wants to get closer. She's, she's, not, she's not treating it too lightly. She's, she's treating it, you know, with appropriate kind of reverence, like I better not get too close. But it's an understandable impulse to want to get closer to something like that. I can certainly understand that. So she has a recognition that the fire has made the water scalding which I guess tells us why the people needed to get out of the water. It's too much heat in the system. She wants to take a picture, so I guess she wants to have a kind of memory. She wants to create a symbolic effigy of whatever this represents. That's important. And something in the psyche won't let that happen, right? Mm -hmm. The psyche blows all of this smoke in, so it's not permitting her to take this little image It's not time yet to see. Mm -hmm. I would say that, I mean, if she was here, I don't know how close she means by close. If we were to take a naturalistic lens, being anywhere near a forest fire is incredibly dangerous. And it can shift in ways you can't imagine. And it's very easy to be overcome by smoke. So there is a really clear and present danger. And tying this, as you had said, into breaking up with the boyfriend, on a feeling level, it's as if her life is burning down. Her fantasies are burning down, her expectations burning down. Whatever she had built on the sustaining of the romance is now on fire. We can look at that teleologically in as much as after forest fires, certain seeds can only generate when they're exposed to great heat. The forest often responds with uh, tremendous luxuriant growth a certain amount of time afterwards, and life does return, although the landscape is totally changed. And it will never quite be the same that the old growth trees are gone at this point, and everything must find its newness, its new way. So taking a picture of the destruction the burning down of the old thing. It's interesting. The fact that heat is also transferring everywhere. The mountain is on fire, the water is boiling, that the emotional intensity of what's going on is substantial and requires a lot of containment for sure. It's an interesting dream. She's, uh, and I agree with you, Lisa, she's in a big change process. Mm-hmm. That... Uh, it's going to also take time, you know, a forest that burns down, it doesn't come back the next day. 
Right. That it requires the kind of seasonal cycles to very slowly and in its own time return to a meadow, and then over ages, decades, it becomes a forest again. Mm-hmm. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.